thanks, um, Suzanne. And um, <laughs> I had a, a flashback there to, um, there was a pediatric, a very famous pediatric surgeon um, called Barry O'Donnell, who was actually president of the British and the Irish Medical and the Canadian Medical Associations at some stage in his career. So he was quite a unique character, but um, having had an overly generous introduction like that, he stood up to speak and said, I can't wait to hear myself. <laughs> so so I, um, I need to be careful here um, 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 in terms of what Suzanne has said. What I want to do, I think um, yesterday we heard George speak, at, or those who were there yesterday morning, and I think there is about the whole issue of healthcare change from the point of view of global health. Um, I'm going to speak about healthcare change at a much more, um, um, I suppose, at the coal front, at the coal face level. And I suppose what I want to try and do is um, to get people to believe that healthcare change and huge change in the healthcare environment is there for all of us. And I know people here come from many different countries, but I would suggest to you, no matter what system you're actually working in, you're either already undergoing, which some are, most as yet aren't, but will do quite dramatically for reasons that I'll try to show to you. But when you actually say that, you, I don't know if that projects very well, but, um, but you know, when you talk about healthcare change, people's eyes glaze over often. And they do for understandable reasons, because everyone, no matter what system we've been in, said, oh my God, another change program. And um, I think the NHS, Charlie, has been famous for this idea with change and change again and change again, because of course it's such a massive system, unified system. But really all over the world, I think people do that. And the reason for that, I suspect, is probably reflected a little bit here, which is most of the change we've seen has been incremental change based on a standardized system that actually has fundamentally changed very little since the 1940s, since the huge hospital building programs post-war, etc. Okay. We've actually just tinkered with systems. And as you tinker with systems, people have become frustrated that they've never really seen fundamental change. My suggestion to you now is that for two fundamental reasons you're going to see real change. One, which should be the right reason, is to actually see care prioritized above all else. And I'm going to suggest to you that the systems, as I did in the title, that the systems that we actually operate have been developed mainly to suit those of us who actually provide the services. And yes, the customers get the best possible service after that. But secondly, and that's never an easy place to change from because we're all very comfortable there. And secondly, however, I'm going to suggest to you that unfortunately that has never been, the idea of optimizing care has never been a really successful way of driving change. The reason you're all going to see significant change is because of the economic imperative that faces most of us now for change to occur. So I'm going to talk about why healthcare systems are inadequate or to make that case to you. And I believe that case is international. What a good system might look like, and you may agree or disagree. Why change is so difficult in health services. And why ultimately radical change is totally dependent on clinicians stepping forward and leading that change. And I think that's been the huge deficit historically. If that's going to happen, clinicians have to take responsibility for making the service better. And maybe, you know, a lot of this is ultimately looking into the future. There is some tea leaves in this, and it's certainly open to argument in terms of some of what I'm going to put forward to you. A lot of this is based on my own experience, as Suzanne mentioned, at the establishment of the Health Service Executive in Ireland, which was the bringing together of really 110,000 people from multiple agencies into a single agency with a budget of about 14 billion euro. And you know the challenges involved in trying to orient an organization like that towards what we would call integrated care. What I'm going to speak about today is integrated care. And those of you from the United States especially, but from other systems, will be very much focused on that over the last couple of years. It is fair to say that the focus in Ireland at the moment is not on integrated care. It's, it's more on a hospital system. And you can argue whether that's the right direction or not. Um, but integrated care is what I'm going to be focusing on today. Now, if we're going to talk about what's right and what's wrong, we need some definition of what we actually want. And I think it would be acceptable to say that quality is what we all want. 
and we want a high quality system. The problem with speaking about a quality system is that unfortunately, if you ask 20 people in a room, what's a, what does quality mean in healthcare, you're likely to get about 18 different answers, okay? And um, it's, like, it's like actually a term the pet used there, translational medicine. Um, I've tried that trick once down in Australia and asked five people in front of an audience what they understood about translational research, rather, and I got five different answers. So you, we, we need to be careful about terminology. So I'm going to try and get over that by using the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, I think I got the term right in the UK, their definition of quality, or at least the three parameters under which they measure it, which is the patient experience, the effectiveness of care and the safety of services. So to speak of quality and what we talk about in terms of systems, that is, the, those are the parameters about which we can actually consider quality. So let me talk in first instance, the first of those, the patient experience and what the patient experience um, 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 might tell us about the quality of our services. To do that, maybe actually I might tell you a personal story. Okay, it may not seem real in the end of the day. But my wife and I decide to take a break and we head off to another city. Let it be Cork in the south of Ireland. We haven't had a break for quite a while and we spend, plan to spend three nights there over a weekend. We show up at the hotel we can call it an international name, like the Western Hotel. We meet the receptionist. We get a wonderful welcome. We go to our room. That night we have a drink in the bar. We retire early with a plan to see the city of Cork, which we don't know that well, and are quite excited about our weekend. We get up in the morning. We go for breakfast. We arrive in the dining hall or the restaurant. Lo and behold, it's 8.30 in the morning, and we see a sign saying, wait to be seated. The maitre d' comes to seat us, we think, and says, sorry, but we've actually served all that we can serve this morning. Our breakfast service is complete. So I jump to attention and say, well, actually, it's okay. We're actually residents in the, um, we're residents in the, um, in the hotel, so it should be fine. And he said, no, actually, it's, sorry, it's not fine. We've done the 150 breakfasts we had planned to do. So um, I'm afraid that's the problem. So I said, but we are residents in the hotel. And he says to me, yes, but you didn't register with us. And I said, no, but we actually checked in the reception. In fact, I booked the room two weeks ago. Yes, but you would have had to book with us three weeks ago because actually we've been booked out for three weeks. So rather than proceed with the argument, we actually go up to the city and we actually have a nice breakfast in uptown in a restaurant and we then actually have a nice walk around Cork and decide to return for a swim at the hotel, which is a fabulous facility, but we go for a swim at 12 o'clock and lo and behold, the pool is closed. And why is the pool closed? Because there's a sign that says Pool will be closed because there is no lifeguard on duty between 12 and 2, and there has to be a lifeguard. It's getting more frustrating. That afternoon, our room isn't made up, and we call housekeeping. Can't get through, so we call a reception. Back to housekeeping. Reception says, so we can't do anything about that. That's actually housekeeping. We call housekeeping, and they say, oh, look, you really would have had the book. You'd have had to register with us seven or eight weeks ago, we were booked out. So, tell you what, we can drop you by some towels. Sounds like a pretty difficult situation. Let's help you. So eventually, in frustration, we seek the manager. And the manager appears, and she's totally apologetic. She said, this happens pretty regularly. People like you come to complain to me, she said. And I said, yeah, but you're the manager. And she said, yes, I'm the manager, but you've got to understand that each part of this hotel is run by professionals. And each of those professionals is independent. And they actually set the standard for the pool and when the lifeguard will be there or not. They actually decide how many rooms will be cleaned. And I, yes, I manage the organization. But I have to respect that each of these are independent entities, OK? OK. Could it happen? I don't know. But think about James. 
Okay, he's 83 years old. Charlie's going to talk about strokes in a minute. He's got paralysis. Not certain that he's intellectual impairment because he's developed bad uh, depression post the stroke, and there's, but there's some issues that he is further impaired. He gets recurrent chest infections. He has feeding difficulties. He's had huge problems with constipation, which is a very significant problem, actually, despite the fact that it might seem somewhat trivial. He has wonderful support from his family. In fact, he has wonderful support from the taxpayer in most of the countries that you or I live in. Services are provided through his primary care or family doctor. There are significant social services support. There's mental health services who are trying to deal for the elderly who are trying to deal with his depression. There is a local rehabilitation structure that's excellent in terms of physiotherapy and occupational therapy. There's a home care service that gives some respite at times, or gives support most days, and in fact there is a respite services for certain weekends. Is this available in your country? This is available in most places in our country. Yes, it gets rationed at times, but in fact it's available in a lot of countries. It is a huge commitment by the taxpayer to actually the health services. You would say that this is a huge effort by everybody involved in society to provide the optimal care for those who are vulnerable and need care. But how about this? Everybody here has to be accessed independently by James through his family. So his family have to actually take him to the mental health services. His family actually get a good service from the primary care doctor. They get wonderful support from the local rehab center. Everybody in each one of these places is working exceptionally hard to provide James and his family with a service. But the only person who's actually bringing messages in any coordinated way between them is James and his family. It's a huge undertaking. In fact, he goes to the hospital and he gets a wonderful service from his local hospital. But he doesn't get a service from the hospital per se. He gets a service from multiple different organizations within the hospital structure. So on one day he gets seen because he's been suffering from aspiration and he gets seen by the chest people. And another day he's been fed by a gastrostomy tube and he gets seen by the surgeons. And another day he gets seen by care of the elderly. Or maybe on the same day people have facilitated that. But in the end of the day, practically none of these people are in any way coordinated either among themselves in terms of his care, and indeed no coordination except through the family to a large degree between them and the services that exist in the community, except perhaps the occasional interaction which is facilitated by the postman. Does it sound like my experience in the Western Hotel? It actually isn't that far off the mark. What would happen to the Western Hotel if it survived, provided me my services like that? It wouldn't last one week. And yet health services have to a large degree managed to provide their services internationally based on this model of actual provision of care. Is this a blame? It's not. It's a system that grew up gradually, 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 got bolted on, got bolted on, but did become a very comfortable system for most of us who actually work within that system. Because I've lived as a subspecialist, as a pediatric gastroenterologist, hepatologist, in one of those hospital boxes. And it's extremely comfortable to have about three barriers there before people actually get easy access to you. So lo and behold, the incentive for me to want to see that system fall apart <coughs> aren't particularly great. So what's the quality? Go well, back to the National Institute of Clinical Excellence. Patient experience, I think you'd have to begin to wonder about it. Effectiveness and efficiency, what would the taxpayer say if they knew that we were spending all this money in all these different boxes and haven't even managed to coordinate that care? Is that effective and efficient use of their funds? I doubt we'd pass many tests on it. And in terms of safety, well, I don't think I need to go into how you might improve safety by actually changing a system per se like that. So ultimately, you'd have to say, yes, it's a service, but whose needs does it prioritize? The Western Hotel has no choice but to prioritize my needs. As I'd show you, in healthcare, we have had a choice. And that's why clinicians have to step forward and actually lead the change, because we've been able to prioritize other, other, um, um, other areas. 
So James is left with a family who are extremely committed, caring, the coordinator of the services, they're the communication portal between services, they travel all over the place, they miss days at work, they take them to different appointments, there's significant expenses and lost work days, as I say. So you would think these people would be confused, frustrated, exhausted. The answer is they are confused, frustrated, and exhausted, just as I was at the Western Hotel. The problem is, instead of actually seeking out the manager and complaining, they're actually resilient, they're patient and accepting, they're thankful, they're appreciative. Thank you very much. Why? Because people are vulnerable. And people are thankful for anything that they get in that environment. So people wait around in an emergency department and when they finally get treated, they don't do like in the Western Hotel and the man, why were they waiting there so long? They say, thank you very much. Unfortunately, in an environment like that, change is always going to be considerably difficult than it will be in other environments. The second big issue we talked about was effectiveness expenditure in terms of quality. We saw some of these figures, I think, yesterday morning with George. But in essence, there is no doubt that the taxpayer has invested hugely in expanding um, um, investment in health services. If you look at these figures, you can see the countries they come from. Australia, this is from a New England Journal paper not that long ago, um, 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 from Harvey Weinberg, and um, you'll see it includes Ireland, Norway, Switzerland, United States, etc. And what you'll spot is, of course, that every country has seen a very significant increase in its GDP. Norway, as you can see, is probably at the lowest end of it, but then its GDP is so high that that can be an outlier. The Look at the American figure. It's the top figure. I don't know if I have a point here or not, but it is the t You can see it's the top. Um, oh, I do. Yeah, OK. So it's the top figure here. Now, that would be wonderful to actually justify that increase in expenditure when you look quickly at this graph. Because look what's happened to our longevity. So surely that investment has been worthwhile if this has actually produced this. Of course, the problem is it hasn't. We now know that 90% of this increase in longevity has actually been due to other factors, uh, mainly socioeconomic. When we actually see here, we can see that the biggest spender in terms of increase is the United States, but in fact, it has seen the poorest increase in longevity. So the two do not overlie. And there are many good examples of this in my own area. I've spent a lot of my life studying the epidemiology of helicobacter infections because of the, the fact that we were always convinced they were required in childhood. And of course, helicobacter, which we now know is caused, for those of you who are old enough to remember when 20 to 25 percent of hospital admissions were peptic ulcer disease, they disappeared. In the developed world, for males, it was gastric cancer was the second biggest killer of males in terms of a solid tumor. It's practically disappeared. You still won't live any longer if you get one than 50 years ago, but you're highly unlikely to get one. So here were huge causes of morbidity and mortality just in my own narrow area, which disappeared, and we did nothing about it. They disappeared because the society got rich or small children stopped getting healed back and you'll never get one after two to three years. It won't cause you disease for 50 years. But so here was an example of improving socioeconomic circumstances with no intervention. And that's actually, in many areas, has led to this type of improvement. So these huge increases in expenditure are difficult to actually justify for more reasons than one. Where has that money gone? Yes, it's gone into improving services. But look what it's also gone into. Okay? These are now estimates. A lot of these estimates are now coming out of mining of the Medicare and Medicaid data in the States, which, of course, is the biggest insurance system in the world. And the capacity to mine it recently has given us huge information on intervention and over-intervention, for instance. So how many of you still live in societies where everybody who gets a significant back pain gets an MRI without any evidence base? In fact, with loads of building evidence that it's actually doing more harm than good, and it leads to huge amounts of unnecessary interventions. And many of you are living in societies where coronary artery stenting is still widespread, rather than just for acute reperfusion. And many of you are living in societies as we are, where arthroscopic knee surgery is actually regularly carried out, despite the fact that the overwhelming evidence is it has the same effect as a placebo. When you looked at prescriptions in America recently, 70% of proton pump inhibitor prescriptions are considered inappropriate. So when we see that massive increase in expenditure, there's little doubt that a lot of it has been explained by inappropriate expenditure. 
screening, prostate cancer, breast cancer, I can hardly stand here and actually be critical of it because it's almost an occupational hazard. But who will step forward and begin to challenge based on overwhelming evidence beginning to appear that we have to start asking serious questions about effectiveness? Individual patient costs of care. Data from the United States showing us that it can vary fourfold within the one department depending on which physician sees you. In Ireland here, when we looked and set up our performance system, we found that stays for appendicectomy in the one surgical department varied between two, three days, sorry, and seven days. Same surgeons working together in the same department. And of course, conflict of interest issues in some parts of the world are massive. And again, now from American data, we know that when equipment is owned by doctors in uh, radiology departments, you see a 48% increase in scanning. So we have now more and more data to suggest that effective expenditure is a big issue in terms of the quality of our services. And then what about the safety of our services? Now, this is just Canadian data because I've used it recently in the Canadian environment. There's also data from the Netherlands that would suggest, and some data from the UK, that would suggest that this is reasonably robust data. It's very hard to totally be accurate in this type of data. But the avoidable deaths in Canada would look to be about 10,000 per year. But we are seeing more and more an improved data on this weekend and nighttime increased deaths. And is that a surprise in a system where we work nine to five, nine to nine, if you want to claim it. But the bottom line is that if I come in on a Saturday night as a major trauma into an intensive care, certainly in this country and still in many countries, I will get end up, end up getting looked after by the registrar or the resident or the fellow, and I will wait for subspecialty care, so, or, or wait for expert care till the morning often. So look, at, enough about what the service is, has been doing and how it measures up the quality, but what would a good health service do? I don't know, are there, is there somebody here from Chile? I think there was somebody here from Chile. Okay, so I don't know if, if you're aware of Francesco Ferrello. Francesco Ferrello was a very famous Chilean neuroscientist, not so much famous as a neuroscientist, as, probably as a philosopher, and then died tragically at a very young age in Paris from, uh, after a liver transplant for hepatitis C. But he came up with this, one of, one of his many writings, and um, this is one of it. And so when it comes to what would you do, he would suggest that we need to be careful, and be careful where you actually start from. There's another way of actually saying this. There's um, a story told in Ireland, for those of you who stay in Ireland, some of you will end up in Kerry in the south west of Ireland, and there's a famous story told in the, of a tourist stopping their car and rolling down the window, trying to get between the two main towns in Kerry, which are Killarney and Tralee, and asking a local farmer on the side of the road, and I'm not running down farmers, I was brought up in a farming community, but asking a local farmer on the side of the road, how will he get from Killarney to Tralee? And the farmer looks back at him and says, well, I wouldn't start from here. So, we were probably ahead of Francesco Ferrella, actually, in terms of this type of observation. So what I um, want to say is it is difficult to start from here. And that's why when I started today, I said, you're going to see fundamental change. It might be a good idea to look at people who aren't clinicians. So when I speak about clinicians, I'm talking about nurses, physios, doctors, occupational therapists. Although I will throw a throwaway comment for which I have no evidence, which is, in my experience, and has been significant in looking for change, shall I call it the non-nursing and medical professions, the physiotherapists and the occupational therapists, etc., in my own experience, have been much more capable of undertaking and looking at change than those of us have been in the more long-established professions. No evidence whatsoever. It's one that I'd be interested if people have feedback on it. So what would a good health service do? Well, let's look at somebody who actually um, looked at it from the outside. don't know if anybody here has read Thomas Moore. He wrote a, a New York Times bestseller called Care of the Soul. Then he got sick and ended up in the health services for a while in the United States, and he came out and he said, there's an opportunity here. So he wrote a book called Care of the Soul in Medicine. And Thomas is a fascinating man, and he ultimately ended up traveling around the states to different departments and with healthcare professionals, helping them perhaps to change how systems operate. But he made these points following his own experience. When a patient is sick, everything in that patient is affected, but only a proportion is addressed. We deal with organs and body parts as separate entities unrelated to the whole. We may only see pain and suffering and fear in the context of a specific disease or organ. We've developed subspecialist systems focused on individual 
organs is his contention. Okay? He tells in his book, Care of the Soul and Medicine, the story of being in the Sloan Kettering in New York. He was invited along by the oncologists, etc., to show how they do deal with people holistically or felt they did. And in his book, he outlines the story of standing at the side of a bed of a man in his 70s who got extremely advanced cancer who looks like he has only a number of days to live. And around that bed takes place a conversation whereby several different clinicians, nurses, doctors, etc., discuss, yes, um, we think he should have one more dose of chemotherapy or one more course starting next week. And yes, the radiotherapist is agreeable that he should have some more radiotherapy. And before he has that, he should have a PET scan, and we're going to arrange that for tomorrow. And after a long conversation, as they're about to walk away, Thomas Moore tells the story of observing them say to this man, to people, is there anything, John, that you would like to know or do you understand what we're doing? And he calls back the senior physician, and this man, who knows he's near the end of his life, said, he said, I'm really not sure I want any of what you're talking about. He said, I'll tell you what I'd love. Could anybody bring me in some banana bread? And in that story, he was trying to say that we just need to be, you know, that, that was a personal experience of him, that we can get lost in terms of maybe what patients truly want a lot of the time. In essence, this is what the Western Hotel would do if it was running the health service. Now, everybody's going to say that this is not the Western Hotel. But let's look at it from the point of view of a health service. If it was the Western Hotel, it would not be James and his family reaching down, seeking out loads of services. It would be James and his family are paying either themselves or through the state service that pays for, for a comprehensive service to treat James. That means that there would be somebody there who would provide that service. Not only in the hotel business, any other business you look at, there would be a comprehensive service provider who would take that payment, and it is then their responsibility, whoever they may be, to provide that service in a coordinated manner. And when I say that to people in different countries, people say, ah, but you don't understand, healthcare is complex. Healthcare is complex in terms of the conditions we deal with. The actual delivery of healthcare services should not at all be complex. It is no more complex than any other industry. We confuse the fact that what we're actually treating is complex with the actual system through which we provide it. And it's extremely important to make that division in our thinking, because that's what often has allowed us to justify actually services and the way that we provide them. So what would the Western Hotel do? It would make certain that James was supplied his service if they wanted to stay in business to a multidisciplinary team in his community, which would include all of these people and would respond in a comprehensive, interactive manner among themselves to ensure he received a service rather than fighting for individual parts of access to a system, all of whom, as I said, are working hard, but are in themselves actually frustrated by their lack of interaction. And indeed, he would have a key worker within that system, be that the manager, the receptionist, whoever who would actually coordinate and make sure that that system operated for him and his family in a highly responsive manner. Yes, there would be a need for always for add-on services. There will always be services that are outside that structure. But again, there will not be individual points of contact. Each of these will be supplied in a coordinated way through that team. Instead of going to your home help, which we would have in Ireland, and having an argument about whether I'm entitled to five hours or you're entitled to five hours, this team, of course, are in the ideal position to say, I'm entitled to it, you're not entitled to it, Suzanne is entitled to it tomorrow because of what has happened to her. It would be totally logical. And this, of course, is what integrated care is all about. You would not have a hospital community divided with such headings. Yes, you have hospital services. But they, again, have to operate with people like geriatricians operating across this line as a single entity. Can this work? It does work. We have a small city or town in the southeast of Ireland, Kilkenny, where we built a system like this, and where the geriatrician actually comes out and does their clinics with the multidisciplinary team in the community, and therefore everybody is fully aware of what's happening with those patients. The critical issue here is going back to this issue of a single service provider. For those of you from the United States, and I'll come back to this in a minute, this is, of course, what's fundamentally happening in your system now um, for reasons that I'll um, display in a minute. 
Once you have that service provider and that single service provider, they are going to ensure that you've got standardized care pathways. The Western Hotel could not provide a service unless their pathways were standardized. Those standardized pathways will result in the development of a comprehensive care plan for each patient. Those of you who are aware of the Kaiser Permanente system in the United States will know how this works. They will insist then on having an electronic health record that will actually allow that to be applied in a very effective manner. But everybody will actually sit up and say, but we don't have an electronic health record. It's actually pointless having an electronic health record, and you never will have one until you first have standardized care pathways leading to comprehensive care plans. Kaiser spent a billion trying to put in an electronic health record without doing this, then went back and did this, made sure all the clinicians operated the standardized care pathways, and lo and behold, subsequently, for half that money, put in the world's most successful electronic health record. There is no point trying to impose a technology to actually develop a process change. You have to put the process change in play and support it with the technology. And finally, of course, they would measure the performance of the system in response to that by this integrated system. Sound complex? It's not, actually. Now, the question is, if it's a logical system, will it still happen? Okay? because even the most illogical of things can actually persist. But this certainly doesn't happen, okay? You don't arrive to your restaurant and discover that every night the actual chef actually only works between nine and five, okay? Because they wouldn't survive. Nevertheless, improving healthcare, the challenge is actually huge, and we shouldn't underestimate it. It's not the complexity that actually makes that challenge so huge. It's actually the number of things that actually are happening. You've got patient care processes to be changed, professional work practices from, you know, people who've been at working in a certain way for many years. You have organizational structures, always difficult to change. You have undergraduate and postgraduate education, which you are the experts on and which this has huge implications for. You've got to develop performance measurement systems because you have to be able to do that. Your payment systems, which is ultimately what's going to drive all of this across the world, have to change. So anybody who actually thinks that there's quick fixes and single stroke solutions, and we've often been subjected to that in this country, so I will, for instance, create even things like hospital groups, or I will do this, or I will do that. There is no simple solution. Somebody yesterday morning, I think somebody from Connecticut mentioned in response to George's talk that it, we're not seeing change on the ground. Change at this level, and if you talk to big corporations like Intel or any of those, even in the private sector where change is much easier, is of the order of a 15 to 20 year process for anybody. I was speaking earlier to one of your colleagues from Mexico here about your change in Mexico, which has been well described in the, in the Lancet, not the New England Journal in the last couple of years, and that's why I was aware of it. But that actually is a 20 year program before you're actually going to see it, okay? So the other thing is that the problems of change become apparent before benefits. And this is a big issue in medicine. If you think of Coca-Cola, if Coca-Cola make a thousand bottles of Coca-Cola and one of them ends up flat when you buy it in a shop, well, it's a problem, but how big a problem? You bought a bottle of flat Coca-Cola, you're going to buy Pepsi the next time, and you probably tell three other people. If one thing goes wrong in a hospital system or in a healthcare system and a patient dies or is badly damaged, the other 9,999 9, out of 10,000 are actually relatively irrelevant. You're actually on the front page of the newspaper and nobody sees anything but the bad. So it is different change. It's not complexity, it's that the risks are actually very, very large and you're moving many different parts. And that problem, and many of those problems become apparent very quickly rather than actually what you're trying to achieve. And in fact, it's been well described when somebody has said every truth passes through three stages. Okay? First, it's ridiculed when change is proposed. Okay? In Ireland, a couple of years ago, we were proposing we needed to stop building hospital beds. People said, we absolutely need three or 4,000 more hospital beds. 
Five years on, everybody says, no, we never needed them. I mean, how did anybody ever think we ever needed them, you know? And that's, that's not us. That's, that's changed generally, you know? Then it's opposed, and then finally it's regarded as self-evident. I'd love to be able to tell you that I actually developed that, but um, it actually was Arthur Schopenhauer, and he found that back in the 1800s it was actually no different. So to get your minds around change, I often think, when you think of Arthur Schopenhauer, a good example is, if you went out to the airport today and you jumped on an airplane, and you went to fly to London from Dublin, and you sat down, put on your seatbelt, and then suddenly the person beside you lit a cigarette, just as you took off down the runway. Everybody starts screeching. The pilot might even put the brakes on. Everybody would look at me for lighting my cigarette and say, how dare you do that? And yet I could have put you on that plane at Dublin Airport 20 years ago, got on the airplane, you sat beside me, I lit the cigarette, you objected, and the hostess would come down and say, that's unreasonable behavior, anybody's entitled to smoke. So when you think of Schopenhauer, and you think of change in general, this is exactly, you would have been ridiculed for suggesting that people couldn't smoke on an airplane 30 years ago. In fact, it was an Air Canada plane, I think, it went on fire that led to it over Cincinnati, wasn't it? And then, of course, we would have huge opposition from all the interests, including the tobacco companies. And then, of course, you get to today when nobody would even dream of it. Okay. So why is achieving change? Well, we looked at this, a couple of colleagues of mine who were involved in change here, and we started doing this with a business journal that we were doing a little bit of work with. And we came up with four factors that we felt that were critical to why healthcare changes can be particularly difficult. The first one is that the provider develops, determines much of the demand. We've known that for years. So what other industry is there where I turn up with you as my doctor, I have my chest pain, I actually might have 40 reasons for that chest pain, including my impending divorce or my business going bankrupt, but it is you who actually will determine that I need a stent, an angiogram, a CAT scan, and an MRI scan. In other businesses, of course it has to be responsive because if I'm not actually providing the service that people want, then my business goes bankrupt. In the business of healthcare, I can generate a huge amount of the demand, so the driver for change is not there to anything like the same degree. Perhaps this is the biggest one. The customer is vulnerable and dependent on the provider, as I said earlier. I get a service. I'm extremely thankful for that service, and irrespective of the way it's provided, I remain extremely appreciative of it. What does that do to me? It makes me a very difficult agent for change. Because yes, I know the system isn't working, but everybody told me I'm wonderful. I'm a pediatrician. Pediatricians and oncologists are probably the most vulnerable to this. Everybody's worried about their kids and so thankful that they get better. Everybody's worried about their cancer and so thankful. So how do I end up? To no fault of my own, I end up as actually almost becoming completely um, uninvolved in change because I can't see that though the system has problems that I could be part of that, I'm being told I'm good. The provider operates outside regular management processes. So you actually have providers who historically and over years have been managed by a management system. But I can turn around as a physician to that management system at any stage or as a nurse or as a physiotherapist and say, hold on a second, this is an individual interaction between me and my patient, and you cannot interfere with that. You can't manage that through ordinary systems. And finally, and extremely importantly, in terms of general system changes, stakeholder responses to change are largely determined by the provider. What do I mean by that? I mean by that that when you actually go to a town in Ireland and say, this hospital is no longer viable, your coronary care unit is crazy. There's three patients a year going through it. Your intensive care unit deals with a couple of patients a month and ventilates them. The local population might very well say, God, yeah, that's a risky place. But what if the local healthcare professionals come out and say, absolutely not, we've got a wonderful service here. The public will say, that guy down from Dublin, no, no, he's just trying to do in our hospital. We really trust the people who are actually telling us who are our professionals. That again, that's not a blame issue. That's the facts of life. So I would suggest to you that once those factors are in play, you've got a unique change agenda, which means that unlike any other industry, the frontline providers will determine how the main users and funders of the systems will react 
in terms of proposing change. That is the opposite to what actually occurs in any other business or structure. And you cannot manage that change, therefore, to what are widely reported business management structures. And invariably, we will hear in all our countries the suggestion, and it's certainly, I only see maybe in the UK and the newspapers here and in Ireland, these suggestions, why don't you bring in the manager of Tesco supermarket? They've run a great service. Put them in and they'll manage the health service. They won't, because they've never dealt with that type of structure. They have never dealt with that type of issue in terms of change. In fact, the only way you're going to get change and serious change in healthcare services is by actually getting the clinicians themselves, nurses, doctors, physicians, to accept, because they can leverage the information in the system and use it to actually bring about a better system. They can optimize patient journeys and experience and the use of resources, and they will do that largely because they are in a position to bring about the implementation of standardized care pathways and to insist on their implementation. And they are in a position to manage professional performance. We set up a thing called HealthStat, put it on the web in terms of actually professional performance, where clinician leaders could look at the figures and the operations within their own hospital and sit down with our colleagues and discuss that performance. The reality is that none of us as healthcare professionals want to be seen as underperforming in the eyes of our peers. The biggest driver of healthcare change by clinicians is actually peer pressure. And of course, we have the capacity in a major way to actually bring the wider stakeholders with us. If clinicians say that the intensive care unit should be closed, that intensive care unit will close. So when we set about an Ireland rationalizing hospital, then we did a significant number of them in the northeast of this country, in the midwest of this country, and some in the south, we absolutely could achieve nothing, only for the fact that local clinicians actually stood up and said, no, this is wrong, we need to take out these services overnight in small hospitals, and took an awful lot of you know, pressure from their colleagues and others to actually begin to actually create this momentum. Once they did so, politicians, public patients, all came on side. But as I say, that's not the Tesco model. They don't depend on that. This can only be achieved by people here leading that change. Now, what about clinical leadership? And Charlie has a lot of experience in this. He's going to speak now in a couple of minutes. And um, so I'm not going to get into this in a big way in terms of the experience on the ground of what clinician leaders can do. But I would make a few brief points. <coughs> developing clinicians is developing them as leaders and not as managers. There's been a huge focus on this issue of managers, 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 and clinicians doing management courses, management courses. It's almost insulting to managers. Management is a professional skill. Yes, we can do a course to learn what that, those managers can and cannot achieve. But how would we as clinicians look on it if managers said, I'm going to do a six-week course. In fact, I'll do a diploma next year, and I'll actually become a physiotherapist or a doctor. We need to respect the fact that our role is as leaders, and there's becoming an awareness now in more and more systems that you can actually lead at this very top level organizations. But what you do need is you need the organizational structures that support that, and most importantly, you need skilled managers working alongside clinician leaders. And that's where the emphasis, so leadership is where the emphasis needs to be put. There is no point in putting clinician leaders into place unless you're giving them authority. You cannot give them responsibility and no authority. You've got to give them authority over service planning and budgets. And as I've mentioned to you, critical is a good performance measurement system. Clinicians can only lead their peers if they have a way of measuring what their peers are actually doing, and that is a huge driver of change. So will clinicians lead? Well, it's difficult because reform doesn't. Services, as I said, as I pointed out to you earlier, we're pretty comfortable with structures that we've actually put in place. And, I, and that's not a criticism. People think that's a criticism. That's just the reality of life, okay? We are, and we would be unique if self-interest wasn't a significant part of our lives. It is of everybody's life. However, most clinicians did undertake a career based on altruism. When I speak to medical students and that, I say, practically every one of you in this room took up a career in medicine because you felt you could make a difference to people's lives. And we've got to get back to that and get people to buy into that all the time. 
people do feel disenfranchised. There's evidence from America that empathy levels drop, would de decrease dramatically as people go through their careers. Our evidence in Ireland is not the same as that, and we think in the UK it may even be different, that we don't see that same level of empathy drop. But in any event, we must convince most clinicians that it is their responsibility, sorry, to, that it is their responsibility to actually improve the overall service. We have got to get away from a point where clinicians can actually turn constantly and say, my patients are extremely well looked after, but the system doesn't work, okay? Well, if you look at the American College of Physicians Ethics Manual, and I haven't looked at many more, that was just easy to get to, okay? It is very, very clear that above our responsibility to individual patients is our responsibility to make optimal use of the system and the resources that are given to us and to see that they're fairly applied. And I have something that I've said often in rooms, which sometimes causes a bit of a, a, a feedback, but it is this. Constantly we are told about the system being wrong, the system being wrong. In practically every system, between 70 and 80 percent of the actual healthcare employees are the combinations of doctors and nurses. If you add physiotherapists, speech and language therapies and others, you get up to 85%. Well, if 85% of the workforce isn't the system, then we have a problem, okay? And that suggests that we're actually not taking on our ethical responsibility to the actual wider system, which I would argue is, and so would the ethics manual, would argue is actually even more important than our responsibility to individual patients. But it's not easy, okay? Because as I say, we have a choice to make. And we can actually look the other way. And we can actually survive looking the other way. But I would make a plea that we actually don't. Thomas Moore would say that the attention to the care of patients is actually very, very positive from our own perspective. In fact, Thomas Moore would go on from, I mean, you can read this quote here yourself, but he would even go further and say, you cannot be one thing at work and another thing at home. And he would actually show you through all their psychological data and that, that people who are empathetic and committed to actually doing the very best thing in terms of providing services are ultimately much happier in themselves. Now, I'm going to finish for a few minutes on funding. Because having put in that plea to you to actually look at all of our systems and accept that change has to be fundamental if we're going to put patients before our own interests, the real truth is change is happening for a different reason. And the reason I can stand here today and tell you that everybody in this room is going to be subject to fundamental change over the next 10 to 15 years is money. And money, I'm afraid, talks maybe louder than anything else. So to talk about that, let me just look at this, and sorry, I'm just going to go back. That should have come up as nothing I can do. I thought they came up as fly-ins, but let me just talk about the existing healthcare system. For the next couple of minutes, we're going to talk about funding systems. Funding systems are going to determine how everything changes, as I said. A lot of our funding systems are either fee per item or allied to that. They're based on volume, paying for volume. So if you're in America or Canada or you're in a lot of European countries, you've got a fee per item insurance system. If you're in a lot of Ireland or you're in the NHS in England, it is still a lot. We think it's a lot different. It's actually not. It's based still on the volume of patients going through. So if this hospital has twice as many patients as that hospital, it actually ends up with twice as much money ultimately, one way or another. Okay. And your providers, therefore, are individual hospitals and professionals. What does that mean? It means Brendan Drum gets a chest pain angina, maybe more than that, very worried, down, happening for a couple of weeks, down to my doctor's office, into my doctor's office in the community. My doctor's office charges for each visit or each intervention one way or another, either through the state system, and, but it's, it's a volume-based approach, and I get care from an individual practitioner. Why will I get care from an individual practitioner? Because that individual practitioner is incentivized to see as many people as possible, and that is what generates income. So what's the incentive for that doctor's office? The incentive for that doctor's office is to get me down to the hospital. And they are delighted to see me in most cases because 
They're being paid by volume, or in some of your, a lot of your systems, in most systems, for each visit, each hospital day, and each intervention. And therefore, care will be provided by the hospital in its own standalone capacity, with no community integration. Why? Because the longer I spend in that system, the more money is generated by that system. And then I end up getting sent home, waiting to get my next bout of angina. Now, the only description for that funding system is the Wheel of Fortune. There used to be a program in North America once called the Wheel of Fortune. It's actually driving itself to an economic system that keeps turning patients, churning them through with all the incentives for everybody to actually move you through quickly and often and with the most intervention possible. The world cannot continue to go with that. Yes, they can give you rapid access to services. And even when you don't get rapid access, like in some of the systems which are, which, uh, are not fee per item, you'll still find that when you get in there, people will say, it's wonderful. Once you get access, it's fabulous because people did everything they could do in the system. There certainly is no incentive to under-investigate. The disadvantages are that there's no provider incentive to control costs. Costs have increased massively. After Medicare was induced, introduced in the 1960s in America, within five years, the cost had increased by 50%. Okay? Increased, and that's been seen. I mean, there's people here from Holland, I think um, you'll see in, your, in the fee per item system where clearly, you know, expenditure running way above in, um, inflation and fee per item systems is a huge problem. Incentive is for over investigation, inappropriate intervention, hospital based treatment, and doctors as technicians. What do I mean by doctors as technicians? We actually, you're asking doctors to care for people in a holistic manner, but you're actually paying them for doing a colonoscopy, you're paying them for being in a stent, purely technical procedures that in any other industry would never be done by the people at that level. When Toyota or General Motors or Mercedes developed their best engine, Yes, they put the brightest engineers in the organization working on it for probably five years, and they may have had hundreds of them at it. They sure as hell didn't build the next million engines with those couple of hundred engineers, or they would have turned out to have very expensive engines. Did that mean that their engines were any worse? No, it didn't. It just meant they, put, they trained people at a skill level, and from your perspective in terms of changes in healthcare, this is hugely important going forward. There's a disincentive hugely to multidisciplinary and holistic care for obvious reasons in such a system. But again, let's get back to money. Why is it going to change? It's going to change. Sorry, the reference isn't on this. This is from a recent um, article in the New England Journal of Medicine. But the data comes, as you say, from the Centers for Medicare, uh, Medicare and Medicaid. And what you will see here is medical. Look at the consumer price index. Look what's happened since 2011 to Medicare and Medicaid per capita as, as we've seen now, you know, the huge changes that you've seen in the United States in terms of actually measuring quality, measuring outputs, and insisting on reduced payments, for instance, when those measures aren't adhered to. Look what's happened to consumer price index. Look what's happened to medical. See that gap? That gap means that the same number of patients are going to be seen going forward, but they're going to be seen for a hell of a lot less money. So somebody has to have to start doing things far more efficiently to cope with this while still providing at this remuneration level. And that's exactly what's happening. And here's how it's happening. People are moving to comprehensive healthcare organizations, as I described to you, because funding is now becoming population and capitation based. More and more in the United States, and it is going to affect the rest of the world, because you're going to see the United States, which has already done, level off at 17% of GDP, and it is going to inflect, because it has to inflect. Because Coca-Cola and Intel and General Motors are saying, we're not paying it anymore, we can't sell our product, because you're taking up so much of our money. So as a result of that change, you are now beginning to see population capitation funding. We've seen a move to what we call bundled payments. Bundled payments is a payment for a procedure, like your hip, like your bypass. That's only a, sta that's only a stage post. We are moving rapidly to a system in those systems which are actually going to say that Brendan Drum is worth 10,000 a year to you. He's 57, gets overweight, drinks a little bit too much at times, you can have 10,000 for him, okay? Brendan Drum's son, He's worth a thousand to you, okay? You take it, you provide their services, and you provide them in a comprehensive way, 
any way you want, but there has to be a service provider who we as Coca-Cola will pay, or we as an insurance company will pay, okay, to provide that service. So now I've got my chest pain, but I'm only worth 10,000 of the system, no matter how often I get my chest pain. I go down to my local health centre. This is not hypothetical, this is actually accountable care organisations and that that you're seeing in the States are now doing this. You go to Indiana, all of the hospitals have essentially amalgamated and actually developed a huge system of buying up the community structures because what they've done is you go to the health centre. There is no gains to the health centre to see me, the money was coming anyway. You go to the hospital, there's no gains because I'm actually on a fixed number. If I never showed up, they're making a fortune. If I keep showing up down here, I, co I cost a fortune if I keep getting in here. So what happens? They join up. And those of you in the States have seen this happening every day. They'll join up. And as they join up, they're actually going to put the direction of flow in the opposite direction. They want me out here. So now people are going to invest in making sure that when Brendan Drum shows up with his chest pain, there is somebody out here who may discuss his social problems. There is somebody out here who may discuss his dietary problems and make sure he doesn't show up too often again with angina. There is something out here who's actually going to look at his compliance. So that he's not going to go around this ongoing circle of back around the wheel of fortune. In fact, you're probably going to have somebody calling me up regularly to see that I take my medication. You're probably going to have some economy up regularly to see that I actually keep my blood sugar in control. And is it that everybody's really caring for me? Yeah, they care. But ultimately, in the end of the day, there's only 10,000. Okay, so let's make sure we now put a system in place as the Western Hotel would. This is not hypothetical, I stress. This is happening, as we say. If you were in Northwestern Chicago, one of America's biggest hospitals, nobody would be here from Illinois, and you were there, you know the Illinois system, Pat. If you were there, told this very recently by the Chief Operating Officer there, if you were there seven years ago, 75% of the physicians were individual, fee per item, billing physicians as endocrinologists, cardiologists, etc. If you go there tomorrow, almost 70% are employed directly by Northwestern. Why? Because within this model, this is exactly what happens. Individual standalone clinicians in the community cannot provide this service. They have to be part of a bigger structure. So the world is changing, and this is the way it will change. The advantages is that you can now promote generalist holistic care. You now will move to multidisciplinary team care because you have to. Appropriate use of doctor skills, I can guarantee you. In my own business of gastroenterology, the idea, and Charlie could probably speak to this in the UK, the idea of doctors doing colonoscopies in 20 years, go back to Schopenhauer, it'll be looked on as quite a laugh. Okay, that's how quickly that will move along and everything else in terms of interventions. You'll have appropriate use of skills, you'll have community-based focused care, and most importantly, as part of that system, you will actually have 24-hour decision-making by senior clinicians. And the disincentives are pretty obvious. The dangers are these, that you end up with under investigations and waiting lists. And of course, this has to be managed very carefully by having your standardized care pathways, okay? And that those standardized care pathways are absolutely adhered to and that the quality is measured based on those pathways. And that is the challenge to make sure that the system doesn't get gamed by those providing the service. So in summary, let me say that systems going forward will reward quality and not quantity. This thing of volume going through is finished. This thing of hospitals saying, we saw 50,000 emergency department visits last year. We are much more important than those guys down the road who saw 30,000. Of course, that should be the opposite. It should be an indictment that they're actually running a system that had to see 50,000 in their community. So that will change. The effect of the intervention and safety will become big issues. It's a major cultural shift for those of us who work because we now will see the experience of patients shaping services. For those of you, and you all are here, are educationists, it completely changes what's going to happen on the ground in terms of skill bases and what people require. And the pace of change will vary. In competitive insurance markets, providers realize the model of care has to change. So again, go back to the United States. I'm not over-focused on the United States, but I have to take my cap off and say I would have been highly critical for my many years living in Canada of the United States system. Many others here would have been, I suspect, as well. For those of you who come from the US, I think you know that. And yet now you're seeing change that is actually going to be instructional to the rest of us. And one of the reasons is 
as I said, because it's a competitive market. So what have big companies started doing? So you've got General Motors and the Coca-Cola saying, we, we actually don't need an insurance company anymore. We're going to actually self-insure our workforce. And by the way, to the local hospital they're saying, we're not paying you a fee per item anymore, we want a fixed price for each of our workers. So as a result, not only are the hospitals buying up the communities, now we've got the insurance companies doing what they gave up 50 years ago, going back buying hospitals because they could become irrelevant unless they become part of the ownership system. So in those environments, change is going to happen much more quickly. With public service systems like you have here or many European countries or in the UK, you will find it will be much slower and that is because vested interests interacting with political systems will lead to much slower progress in terms of change. So ironically, the USA could be the first to achieve a fully integrated system. And everybody here will say, oh, not the USA, they haven't been able to do it. You're confusing two things. You're confusing equity of access with the quality of a system. The USA may not still, despite Obama reforms, get the equity of access, but we need to stop confusing the two issues. You could have a superb healthcare system, fully integrated, you may still not have equity of access, it may still not be fair, but we've got to stop this idea of mixing up the two that it's bad because it doesn't have equity of access going forward. It has been bad without equity of access, as have many of our systems. So let me finish with a few things just to say, okay, everybody here is going to say, because we're all coming from clinical backgrounds, where's the evidence for all of that? Okay, and the answer is, it'll be years before you can have that evidence and you may never have that evidence because we haven't been able to measure what we're doing particularly well either. But the bottom line is, this is one way to jump out of an aeroplane and it's a way that most of you probably wouldn't take. Okay, I suggest that practically everybody in this room would actually use the parachute, okay? And you've probably seen this before, but guys, there's never been a randomized controlled trial. And I would suggest to you in terms of change in healthcare that the imperative for change is so great in terms of what we do to patients that we can't afford to have that argument uh, at a theoretical level. Anybody here heard Thomas Allenson? I'm going to give you the green. Charlie, you've not heard of Thomas Allenson. He spent time up in your country, I'll tell you, in Edinburgh, okay? So there you go, nobody here has heard of Thomas Allenson. Well, this man was the first ever in the world to describe one of the most fundamental issues in terms of public health. Now, look, at he's not, as fa he's not as good as I'm going to paint him to be. He grew up in Manchester, he qualified in the University of Edinburgh in 1881, and subsequently ended up working in a very deprived area of London, which had a huge amount of smoke from coal and all sorts of open fires, etc. But he started writing very regularly to the Lancet. Now, he was a contrarian. And for anybody here who is a contrarian, I don't exclude myself from that. Um, that's not necessarily always bad, but it can be. Um, but look what he did. In his letters to the Lancet and others, he's, he was three hours a day walking and other exercise, he's, he advised, cutting down on salt before anybody had ever suggested it. Eat whole grain rather than white bread. Here's the 1880s, folks, okay? Right? Eat more fruit and vegetables. Avoid tea and coffee before bed. Be teetotal. That wouldn't have gone down too well around here. But anyway, um, oppose many medical drugs of the day because he actually knew or identified that they actually had a lot of opiates and arsenic in them. However, like all contrarians, small problem. He also was a major opponent of smallpox vaccine. So you don't get it all right, okay? This is all about change. Sorry, I didn't put the reference to this. I must get it. He actually was the first person then to start writing to the Lancet and say, stop smoking, it's bad for your health. And this should be in quotations, actually, it is a quotation. Nicotine is a foul poison. So I left the quotation marks off this. And here you go. None of us actually know who he is. Well, in fact, it's not a surprise because he's best known today, up around the Midlands in England. Alan, have you heard of Alan's bakery? So, because he set up a whole grain. He was so focused on whole grain, he set up a bakery to produce the product. Lucky for him, actually, because it became his career. Why? Change doesn't go down too good. Right? 
If any of you get a chance, visit the northwest of Ireland where I grew up as a young fellow. This is Ben Bulban Mountain. I showed this once in North America and somebody said Irish Rock and then somebody said Tabletop Mountain in South Africa. It's not. It's Ben Bulban under which William Butler Yeats um, um, is buried down in the northwest. So if you hang around for a few days, this is my promo for my local area. Okay. Listen, thank you all very much. Okay.